You know what time it is. Woo! Get into it! Get into it! Yes! One of these days, I'm going to catch the book the right way. I used to do this all the time at Regal, where I would flip a box of Raisinets, and I would always be like, would you like a box of Raisinets today? And it would work every time. Hi, welcome to Storytime with Chris. Like I always say, you don't have to watch these videos when they go live. You're more than welcome to watch them in your downtime, nap time, max and relax and chillax and time, break time, in between time, study time. Anytime you want to hear a highly animated voice bring you wonderful stories of magic, fantasy, science fiction, adventure, and many, many more in between. And today is a very special episode because I have a wonderful guest who is bringing us live acoustic accompaniment for our continued reading of Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events, The Wide Window. So if you remember from last chapter, the Baudelaire's are settling in at Aunt Josephine's house and apparently she's afraid of the stove exploding. She's afraid that doorknobs will explode. She's afraid of burglars, so she's what we would call kids very paranoid a word which here means unexplainably fearful of a lot of different things that may or may not happen i can be paranoid at times other people i know can be paranoid at times but it all happens to everybody there are just some things that you can be hyper aware of that make you seem like very overly cautious about certain things like for example, I sleepwalk. Yes, that is totally a thing. My mother can attest to this. So there was a period of time, and it still happens in my adult life, where I would walk around the whole house and make sure all the doors and windows were locked. And I would do it multiple times. In the midst of me being asleep, I would walk around and do this. And yes, this is totally a thing. Um, and my mom would have to like call me from her bed, and like, Chris, uh, go to bed. Um, I would walk back to my bed and go to sleep, but then I would put clothes on and my mom would have to come in and check on me and like take off all the layers I put on. It was weird. It was a time. But we're not going to deal with paranoia today. Because we came to read. And if you haven't already done so, the YouTube channel's link is within my bio on Instagram as well as Facebook. If you have not already done so, like, share, subscribe. It only takes less than 30 seconds. I don't do this for profit. This is a passion project for my love of literature to get kids as well as adults excited about the magic of reading. Because no matter how old or young you are, reading is not just fundamental, it is essential. <laughs> Nothing will ever take away the magic of flipping pages of a book. And I have digital books, but like I always prefer the physical copy. Just saying. Chapter 3. There is a way of looking at life called keeping things in perspective. This simply means making yourself feel better by comparing the things that are happening to you right now against other things that have happened at a different time or to different people. For instance, if you were upset about an ugly pimple on the end of your nose, you might try to feel better by keeping your pimple in perspective. You might compare your pimple situation to that of someone who was being eaten by a bear, and when you look in the mirror at your ugly pimple, you could say to yourself, well, at least I'm not being eaten by a bear. You can see at once why keeping things in perspective rarely works very well, because it is hard to concentrate on somebody else being eaten by a bear when you're staring at your own ugly pimple. So it was with the Baudelaire orphans in the days that followed. In the morning, when the children joined Aunt Josephine for breakfast of orange juice and untoasted bread, Violet thought to herself, Well, at least we're not being forced to cook for Count Olaf's disgusting theater trip. In the afternoon, when Aunt Josephine would take them to the library and teach them all about grammar, Klaus thought to himself, Well, at least Count Olaf isn't about to whisk us away to Peru. And in the evening, when the children joined Aunt Josephine for a dinner of orange juice and untoasted bread, Sunny thought to herself, Zax! which meant something along the lines of, well, at least there isn't a side of Count Olaf anywhere. But no matter how much the three siblings compare their life without Josephine to the miserable things that had happened to them before, they couldn't help but be dissatisfied with their circumstances. In her free time, Violet would dismantle the gears and switches for the model train set, hoping to invent something that could prepare hot food without frightening Aunt Josephine. But she couldn't help wishing that Aunt Josephine would simply turn on the stove. 
Boss would sit in one of the chairs in the library with his feet on a footstool, reading about grammar until the sun went down. When he looked out of the gloomy lake, he couldn't help wishing that they were still living with Uncle Monty and all of his reptiles. And Sunny would take time out from her schedule and bite the head of Pretty Penny, but she couldn't help wishing that their parents would, were still alive, that she and her siblings were safe and sound in the Bodler Mansion. Aunt Josephine did not like to leave the house very much because there were so many things outside that frightened her. But one day the children told her what the cab driver had said about Hurricane Herman approaching, and she agreed to take them into town in order to buy groceries. Aunt Josephine was afraid to drive in automobiles because the doors might get stuck leaving her trapped inside. Which is a form of claustrophobia, which I also have that. I don't like tight knit spaces. It does make me a bit claustrophobic. A word which here means fear of enclosed spaces causing one to hyperventilate. It is a condition that happens to a lot of people, kids. It's nothing to be ashamed of. So they walked the long way down the hill. By the time the Baudelaire's reached the market, their legs were sore from the walk. Are you sure that you won't let us cook for you? Violet asked as Aunt Josephine reached into a barrel of limes. When we lived with Count Olaf, we learned how to make puttanesca sauce. It was quite easy and perfectly safe. Aunt Josephine shook her head. It is my responsibility as your caretaker to cook for you, but I'm eager to try this recipe for cold lime stew. Count Olaf certainly does sound evil. Imagine forcing children to stand near a stove. Oh! <laughs> he was very cruel to us, Klaus agreed, not adding that being forced to cook had been the least of their problems when they lived with Count Olaf. Sometimes I still have nightmares about the terrible tattoo on his ankle. It always scared me. Aunt Josephine frowned and patted her butt. I'm afraid you made a grammatical mistake, Klaus, she said sternly. What you said, it always scared me. You sound as if you meant that his ankle always scared you, but you meant his tattoo. So you should have said the tattoo always scared me. Do you understand? Yes, I understand, Klaus said, sighing. <sighs> Thank you for pointing that out, uh, Aunt Josephine. Nikra! Sonny shrieked, which probably meant something along the lines of, it wasn't very nice to point out Klaus's grammatical mistake when he was talking about something that upset him. No, no, Sonny, Aunt Josephine said firmly, looking up from her shopping list. Niku isn't a word. Remember what we said about using correct English? Now, Violet, would you please get me some cucumbers? I thought I would make chilled cucumber soup again sometime next week. Violet groaned inwardly, a phrase which here means said nothing but felt disappointed at the prospect of another chilly dinner. Which, personally speaking, Aunt Josephine could have easily bought some bread, some lunch meat, some cheese, a bit of mayo, maybe some ketchup, maybe some mustard, and then you could have had, like, some sandwiches instead of cold cucumber soup. That's just, no. And thank you for watching. <laughs> But she smiled at Aunt Josephine and headed down an aisle of the market in search of cucumbers. She looked wistfully at all the delicious food on the shelves that required turning on the stove in order to prepare it. Violet hoped that someday she could cook a nice hot meal for Aunt Josephine and her siblings using the invention she was working on with the model train engine. For a few moments she was so lost in her inventing thoughts that she didn't look where she was going until she walked right into someone. Excuse me, Violet started to say. But when she looked up, she couldn't finish her sentence. There stood a tall, thin man with a blue sailor hat on his head and a black eye patch covering his left eye. He was eagerly smiling down at her as if she were a brightly wrapped birthday present that he couldn't wait to rip open. His fingers were long and bony, and he was leaning awkwardly to one side, a bit like Aunt Josephine's house dangling over the hill. When Violet looked down, she saw why. There was a thick stump of wood where his left leg should have been, and like most people with peg legs, this man was leaning on his good leg, which caused him to tilt. But even though Violet had never seen anyone with a peg leg before, this was not why she couldn't finish her sentence. The reason why had to do with something she had seen before. The bright, bright shine in the man's one eye, and above it just one When someone is in disguise, and the disguise is not very good, one can describe it as a transparent disguise. This does not mean that the person is wearing plastic wrapper glass or anything else transparent. It merely means that people can see through his disguise. That is, the disguise doesn't fool them for a minute. 
Violet wasn't fooled for even a second as she stood staring at the man she walked into. She knew at once it was Count Olaf. Violet, what are you doing in this aisle? Aunt Josephine said, walking behind her. This aisle contains food that needs to be heated, and you know... When she saw Count Olaf, she stopped speaking. And for a second, Violet thought that Aunt Josephine had recognized him too. But then Aunt Josephine smiled and Violet's hopes were dashed. A word which here means shattered. Hello, Count Olaf said, smiling at Aunt Josephine. I was just apologizing for running into your sister here. Aunt Josephine's face grew bright red, seeming even brighter under her white hair. Oh no, she said as Klaus and Sonny came down the aisle to see what the fuss was about. Violet is not my sister, sir. I am her legal guardian. Count Olaf clapped one hand to his face as if Aunt Josephine had told him she was the Tooth Fairy. I can't believe it, he said. Madam, you don't look nearly old enough to be anyone's guardian. Aunt Josephine blushed again. Well, sir, I have lived by the lake my whole life, and some people have told me that it keeps me looking youthful. <laughs> I would be happy to have the acquaintance of local personages, Count Olaf said, tipping his blue sailor hat and using a silly word which here means person. I'm new to this town and beginning a new business, so I'm eager to make new acquaintances. Allow me to introduce myself. Klaus and I are happy to introduce you, Violet said, with more bravery than I would have had when faced with meeting Count Olaf again. Aunt Josephine, this is Count... No, no, Violet, Aunt Josephine interrupted. Watch your grammar. You should have said Klaus and I will be happy to introduce you because you haven't introduced us yet. But Violet started to say, Now, Veronica, Count Olaf said, his one eye shining brightly as he looked down at her. Your guardian is right, and before you make any other mistakes, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Captain Sham, and I have a new business renting sailboat out on Damascus Dock. I am happy to make your acquaintance, miss. I am Josephine Unwhistle, Aunt Josephine said, and these are Violet Klaus and Little Sunny Baudelaire. Little Sunny. Count Sham repeated, sounding as if he were eating Sunny rather than greeting her. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Perhaps someday I can take you on the lake for a little boat ride. Gage! Sunny shrieked, which probably meant something like, I would rather eat dirt. Which is a good way to insult somebody who's being rude to you or trying to make you do something you don't want to do, like... Okay, this is telling a story about myself. So, uh, really quickly, there was a point in time where it was winter and it was very cold in Cleveland and somebody had dared me to stick my tongue on a basketball pole to see if it would get stuck. And I said, I would rather eat, I'd rather eat dirt. That's what I said. And then I called him a buckethead, which is not nice to say, kids. Don't call anybody a buckethead. It's true. We're not going anywhere with you, Klaus said. Aunt Josephine blushed again and looked sharply at the three children. The children seem to have forgotten their manners as well as their grammar. She said, please apologize to Captain Sham at once. He's not Captain Sham, Violet said impatiently. He's Count Olaf. Aunt Josephine gasped and looked for the anxious faces of the Baudelaire's to the calm face of Captain Sham. He had a grin on his face, but his smile had slipped a notch. A phrase which here means grow less confident as he waited to see if Aunt Josephine realized he was really Count Olaf in disguise. Aunt Josephine looked him over from head to toe and then frowned. Mr. Poe told me to be on the watch for Count Olaf, she said finally. But he did also say that you children tended to see him everywhere. I rolled my eyes on... I'll explain later. I rolled my eyes for a reason because... It's going to be a running trend for a couple of these books. Just bear with me. We see him everywhere, Klaus said tiredly, because he is everywhere. Who is this Count Omar person? Count Sham, Ca Captain Sham asked. Count Olaf, Aunt uh, Josephine said, is a terrible man who is standing right in front of us. Violet finished. I don't care what he calls himself. He has the same shiny eyes, the same single eyebrow, but plenty of people have those characteristics, Aunt Josephine said. Why, my mother-in-law had not only one eyebrow, but also one ear. 
The tattoo, Klaus said. Look for the tattoo. Count Olaf has a tattoo of an eye on his left ankle. Captain Sham sighed and with difficulty lifted his peg leg so everyone could get a clear look at it. It was made of dark wood that was polished to shine as brightly as his eye and attached to his left knee with a curved metal hinge. But I don't even have a left ankle, he said in a whiny voice. It was all chewed away by the lacrimose leeches. Aunt Josephine's eyes welled up. And she placed a hand on Captain Sham's shoulder. Oh, you poor man, she said. And the children knew at once that they were doomed. Did you hear what Captain Sham said? She asked them. Violet tried one more time, knowing it would probably be futile. A word which here means filled with... Brutality. He's not Captain Sham, she said. He's... You don't think he would allow the lacrimose leeches to chew off his leg? Aunt Josephine said, just to play a prank on you. Tell us, Captain Shem, tell us how it happened. Well, I was sitting on my boat just a few weeks ago, Captain Shem said. I was eating some pasta with puttanesca sauce. And I spilled some on my leg before I knew it, the leeches were attacking. That's just how it happened with my husband, Aunt Josephine said, biting her lip. The Baudelaire's, all three of them, clenched their fists in frustration. They knew that Captain Sham's story about the Putanesca sauce was as phony as his name, but they couldn't prove it. Here, Captain Sham said, pulling a small card out of his pocket and handing it to Aunt Josephine. Take my business card, and next time you're out in town, perhaps we could enjoy a cup of tea. That sounds delightful, Aunt Josephine said, reading his card. Captain Sham sailboats. Every boat has its own sail. Oh, Captain, you have made a very serious grammatical error here. What? Captain Sham said, raising his eyebrow. The card says, it's, with an apostrophe. I-T apostrophe S always means it is. You don't mean to say every boat has its own sail. You meant simply it's, belonging to it. It's a very common mistake, Captain Sham, but a dreadful one. Captain Sham's face darkened, and it looked for a minute like he was going to raise his peg leg again and kick Aunt Josephine with all his might. But then he smiled, and his face cleared. Thank you for pointing that out, he said finally. You're welcome, Aunt Josephine said. Come, children, it's time to pay for our groceries. I hope to see you soon, Captain Sham. Captain Sham smiled and waved goodbye, but the Baudelaire's watched as his smile turned to a sneer as soon as Aunt Josephine had turned her back. He had fooled her, and there was nothing the Baudelaire's could do about it. They spent the rest of the afternoon trudging back up the hill, carrying their groceries, but the heaviness of cucumbers and limes was nothing compared to the heaviness in the orphans' hearts. All the way up and up the hill, Aunt Josephine talked about Captain Sham and what a nice man he was and how much she hoped they would see him again. While the children knew he was really Count Olaf, and a terrible man, and hoped that they would never see him for the rest of their lives. There is an expression that I am sad to say is appropriate for this part of the story. The expression is falling for something hook, line, and sinker. And it comes from the world of fishing. The hook, the line, and the sinker are all parts of a fishing rod, and they work together to lure fish out of the ocean to their doom. If somebody is falling for something hook, line, and sinker, they are believing a bunch of lies and may find themselves doomed as a result. Aunt Josephine was falling for Captain Sham's lines, hook, line, and sinker, but it was Violet, Klaus, and Sonny who were feeling doomed. As they walked up the hill in silence, the children looked down at Lake Lacrimos and felt the chill of doom fall over their hearts. It made the three children feel cold and lost as if they were not simply looking at the shadowy lake, but had been dropped into the middle of its depths. And that is where we are going to end for today. You know, I don't remember who said it, but it, this phrase, this Colloquial phrase comes to mind. Colloquial meaning a common phrase of a community or region. So, fool me once, 
shame on well no I think it's fool me once shame on you fool me twice shame on me and these people keep getting fooled by Count Olaf with these terrible disguises but we'll see what happens because this story does take a bit of a turn as we get into the later chapters and as we get closer to the mystery that is to unfold but as always, you can always watch these videos when you have time, in your free time. I don't do this for profit. That's not why I started this three years ago. Yes, it's been three years of story time with Chris. Three years as of March 27th of this year. My first book I read for story time was The Velveteen Rabbit, which I do plan on reading again as like an anniversary special type of deal. But I want to set that up properly and give you proper notice for that. As always, I love you all so very much. And I'll see you next time. Have a great day, y'all. Bye-bye now.